Here's the crazy thing about storytelling. Most of us do it all the time, and because of that, we feel like we know what it is. However, we've all at some point experienced storytelling at a higher level, and we know in our gut that there's a lot more going on than we might realize. That, my friend, is where I want to pull back the curtain for you today on that higher level of storytelling. See, there's everyday water cooler, make a random social media post kind of storytelling, and then there's strategic storytelling. It's the kind of storytelling that grabs people's attention, it brings messages to life, it builds influence, and it makes people say yes to whatever you're asking them or whatever you happen to be selling. Strategic storytelling exists in forms that you probably already recognize, but it also exists in a bigger form that you probably don't recognize because hardly anyone ever talks about it. And that kind of storytelling is woven throughout every moment of our life, and the power of it is available to you right now. Keep listening to find out how. Welcome to the Story Greenlight Podcast, where we're all about helping professional advisors tell your stories so that you can serve more clients and expand your impact in the world. My name is Jeff Barch. I am a communicator and marketing strategist with over 20 years of experience working with ABC, NBC, Universal, Disney, Apple, and thousands of students and clients around the world. At Story Greenlight, we believe that real people trust real people and that human connection is everything. If you've ever told a story and then thought to yourself, hey, I know what it means to tell a story. I'm a storyteller. Well, you know, you're not wrong. You have told a story, which technically makes you a storyteller. But saying that you now know all about story is kind of like saying, OK, I grabbed my surfboard. I went out to the beach, uh, you know, pick your random ocean beach and I caught some waves and then I paddled back in. And then you then you say, I know the ocean now. Well, you have some experience with a tiny sliver of the ocean, but there's a lot of more to learn than just that part of the ocean that you just experienced. And the same thing applies to the art of storytelling. And I started learning about this from a very, very young age, the age of four, to be exact. That's when someone, a uh, so family friend gave us a piano and we got a, this great big old upright piano in our house. And I went up to that thing and I started picking out melodies on it. And uh, I... I was having some fun and I was, you know, I, I was pressing the different notes and I f figured out that I could match different melodies that I've been hearing uh, from different parts of the world, in my, in my little four-year-old world at that point. And I figured out I could play Mary Had a Little Lamb, do, 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 you know, that kind of thing. And I, I figured out Mary Had a Little Lamb and pretty soon I moved on to Old MacDonald and his farm. And there was a day that after I had picked out the regular notes, the whole <whistles> that kind of thing, there was a day when I figured out that you could actually change some of these notes and it completely changed the feel of the song. So instead of <whistles> I started playing on this piano I had discovered that if you change a couple of the notes, you can make it, instead of sounding all happy, you can make it sound sad and spooky. I discovered the minor key. And uh, and I realized, it just in just a little inkling in my four-year-old brain, I wasn't just changing the notes, I was changing how the song felt. And all of a sudden, <laughs> my old McDonald's farm wasn't this crazy happy place anymore. It was some place almost kind of sad or spooky or maybe even scary. And uh, that is when my mom said, okay, get this kid some lessons because clearly he's got something going on here. And so I moved on from there. I started uh, classical piano lessons from that point. And so I had always played by ear and played uh, by classical training. And uh, growing up, when I got into elementary school, I kind of gravitated towards the Bach and Mozart, that kind of stuff. And I liked them because they were super clean and they were technical and I could just, I could get my fingering right and I could get everything just so I could play the notes on the page and be good. And uh, 
the more I learned, the more I learned about piano, the more I got frustrated with another area of my life, which would be Sunday mornings. So I grew up going to church every Sunday morning and the music at our church drove me nutty. It just drove me crazy because we sang songs that all had five verses and we usually sang all five verses except for the random times which we dropped verse number four because even then the people knew that five verses was just too many. But even when we sang, even when we sang just four verses, it still drove me nuts because every verse played the same was, was played the same way every single time and it drove me absolutely nuts. It was boring me out of my mind. And so that kind of that was poking at me. And there was a day when I was actually at our church. I was sitting at the piano and playing probably some of my Bach or Mozart and one of the ladies at the church came up to me and said you know, Jeff, it's all well and good to play the notes on the page, but as you get older, you need to learn to play from your soul. So I was probably about four, fourth grade at this point, so maybe 10 or 11 years old. And when this lady told me about playing from your soul, I thought to myself, that has got to be the stupidest thing ever. I have the notes, I play the notes on the page, and that's all you need. Irony, <laughs> I was still, the, the Sunday morning thing was still driving me nuts, and it actually was even more annoying to me because that lady who told me that, in my mind, was part of the problem because she was one of the church musicians who played the hymns all the same every single verse. So that... As it turned out, she was right. And when I, uh, but, but I didn't ever actually get to the point that there was no specific moment when I realized that. It happened by moment after moment after moment over the span of years. And what it looked like for me was at the beginning, people said, oh, Jeff, that was such a great song you played this morning. That you're, you're a really great piano player. And I just smiled and strutted and thought I was all that. And uh, it started to change from that to, Jeff, thank you. Thank you for that song this morning. And it changed into, Jeff, the way you played that song really brought that song to life for me. Thank you so much. And every once in a while, every once in a while, when, uh, when everything lined up, someone came up to me and said, Jeff, the way you played that brought me into an encounter with God today. Thank you so much. And I realized that the lady was right. You do need to play from your soul, and there is a whole other world of what you play other than just the notes on the page. It turned out that that concept of playing with your soul, the idea of actually bringing the message of what you're doing to life. That showed up in lots of different ways over my life. It started me playing piano. Uh, for the first 20 years of my life, I was known as Jeff the Piano Guy. And when I got into high school, uh, I started learning about video production and I learned what it was like to go beyond just a regular video that, that was just doing the bare minimum and doing, and doing things that elevated it and took that message and brought that message to life in the hearts and minds of the audience. I started learning how that worked in high school. I got into college and I started doing radio work. I got out to film school in Los Angeles and started applying that to film and ended up getting into the entertainment industry in Hollywood and did that for the next 20 years, shaping content for ABC and NBC and Universal and Disney and Apple and all these folks. And I thought that... For years, I thought that all those activities that I'd done over the years, you know, they seemed to be sort of related, you know, just the idea of communication, media, all that kind of a thing, but I thought that they were separate. Turns out, they were actually all connected by this higher commonality, which I've started calling the thing over the thing. It's not just the thing under the thing that we talk about here. It's also the thing over the thing. The idea of human connection and bringing messages to life 
through strategic storytelling in whatever form that happens to show up. That is the power that drives all those different things, and that's the power that I want to help you unlock for yourself and your business. Now, here's the problem. It is easy to sleep on the concept of story because it's something that feels familiar. And it should. I mean, because we are all living our own personal story structure every moment that we're alive. We are all living stories. And we tell stories to each other in one form or another all the time, sometimes without even thinking of it. Having said that, we know, we all know that there's more. I mean, because we recognize a powerful story when we hear it because it affects us. A powerful story, it makes us think or it prompts feelings in us. And powerful stories literally change the chemistry of the hormones flowing through our bloodstream our brains are, are wired to release different hormones when we hear a story that we connect to. And maybe it's a story that we hear in a keynote speech or on a TED Talk or at a sermon at church, or maybe it's the feeling of being taken on a ride after reading a great book or watching a TV show or movie or something like that. When we recognize these kind of signs, that's when we're going beyond just every day, this random thing happened, kind of water cooler or random social media posts kind of storytelling, and we are experiencing strategic storytelling. At this point, the question becomes, what is strategic storytelling? And because if you look it up online, if you, if you Google strategic storytelling, you'll find all kinds of different variations of it. You'll have some people say that it's specifically related to business, and it can be, but it doesn't have to be. I'm going to make it kind of a broader definition for the sake of our conversation here. I'm calling it intentional storytelling for a specific purpose. Strategic storytelling shows up in two main forms, in long-form narrative and short-form narrative. Now, as you'll see, there are different goals and different ways that it shows up, but these are the main ways that we can kind of wrap our heads around it for the conversation here. Uh, most of the time, when you have long-form strategic storytelling, the goal, you know, going back to the definition, the, the idea of intentional storytelling for a specific purpose, or in this case, a goal. The goal of long-form narrative usually is to be the experience itself. And usually, in the business context, it is to sell the experience. So the question, who does this? The idea is Hollywood does it, the TV industry does it, the traditional publishing industry does it, uh, specifically long form books. And the way they do it, they publish and they sell books, they produce and they release movies, and they have streaming platforms. Now, we have lots of streaming platforms online that have long form narrative where the content is the experience and they're selling you access to that experience. One of those moments that's always stuck in my heart and mind for years and years and years was the time when I was living in my own little studio apartment just west of downtown Los Angeles, and uh, I was single. I was wanting to not be single. This was in my early 20s, and uh, little did I know how long I'd have to wait until I would not be single, but that's a whole other story. Uh, I saw the movie called The Road to Perdition, starring Tom Hanks, and that story that movie has themes of fatherhood, uh, fathers and sons and family, and fathers doing anything, a father who would do anything within his power to protect and provide for his family, even if it meant participating in evil while desperately trying to escape that evil. It was this incredible, beautiful story that just absolutely, uh, just absolutely wrecked me when I saw it. And uh, I actually finished watching the movie and I literally put on my shoes, jumped into my car and I drove to Amoeba Records up in Hollywood so I, just so I could buy the soundtrack to that movie just as soon as I possibly could. And I played that soundtrack in my car over and over and over and over for quite some time. So 
Yes, when you have long story, when you have long form narrative content, the the experience is what is being sold. This also happens in television, in both traditional over the air media and long form streaming. Now, the goal here is not so much to sell access to the experience itself, although you know one could argue that if you have cable television, if you still happen to use traditional cable television or um, or streaming platforms, then that's like long form movies kind of thing. The experience is the point. You're being sold access to all this stuff. But it's not just that. It's more getting and keeping your attention so that you can be exposed to either philosophical or more likely commercial messages in the process. If you're watching a documentary movie, a lot of the time documentaries have uh, messages that they want to communicate to the audience. So there's the philosophical end of that. But really, the thing that most of us have grown up around is the idea of traditional television being a vehicle for the commercials. The commercials are what have always made traditional broadcast television possible. That's what makes the money go round is the advertising money. So whole other whole other discussion right there. Uh, Going to leave that there for the moment. But the bigger point is you have strategic storytelling where the experience is the point or long form content is the it, it, it is created with the goal of keeping your attention so that you can get what get commercials fed to you. Now, long form narrative content is hard to do. The longer the format, the more the moving pieces that you, you have to have in order to keep people's attention. And this is hard. Not even the very best, most skilled, accomplished professionals do this all the time. And this is why everyone complains about there's so much bad TV and bad movies in Hollywood, blah, blah, blah. This is why, because it's hard. The good, so the, the good news is in business, we hardly ever have to go long form. Short, st short form storytelling is way easier to get right. So there's strategic storytelling in long form. Then there's also strategic storytelling in short form narrative. Now, for the record, this can also devolve quickly into the everyday low value water cooler storytelling. I mean, the lines can quickly get blurry here, but bear with me here. When you have uh, thoughtfully crafted strategic storytelling uh, via TV, either online or social media, you have the goal of holding and keeping the attention of the audience. That is the point, so you can be exposed to commercial messages while you do. So this happens in traditional TV. It also happens, of course, in online media. So a primary example is YouTube and other social media platforms where you get, you, you can get high quality, thoughtfully crafted content that are, <laughs> if you wanna be cynical, they are the placeholders for the promoted posts, which they are the corollaries to the commercials in traditional broadcast television. That is what makes the world go round, uh, the world of media go round. It's the advertisements. Now, this is where things start to get good for us in the world of business, because this is what brings us to self-contained narrative with strategic storytelling in short form, self-contained story narratives. And it can be one short spoken story. It can be a written story. Uh, it can show up in all kinds of different forms. But really, this is where we start to get more nuanced in what the goal is. It's not just, hey, tell a story and that's the experience and that's the point. We're gonna sell you access to the experience. And it's not also, hey, we're gonna tell you a story so we can checkerboard it with advertisements and that's how we make our money. Here, the goal is 
to use the story itself to illustrate an idea, to persuade someone, to bring multiple parties into alignment around an idea or a cause. Sometimes we tell self-contained stories to motivate or to inspire. And in business, it shows up all sorts of different places. The big areas are, of course, public-facing messaging in marketing, public relations. It shows up in the sales process. And it shows up also in internal communication, especially when you have a business that's no longer running in a garage with two or three people and everyone knows what the company is and why we're all there. When you get past a certain threshold of employees at a company, you get people coming on board and they may or may not know who the founder is, why the founder started the thing up in the first place, or why they should be there for any other reason other than just collecting a paycheck. And this is where internal communication becomes far more important. Persuasion of internal audiences and stakeholders. And so these kind of self-contained narratives, these can be, these can show up as what I call power stories. Things like your origin story as a founder, your origin story of your company, the organizational purpose, why you're here, uh, stories about your product, what is the benefit that your product or service brings to the people that you serve. Um, You can talk about specific customer stories, about how their lives were this way before they interacted with your company and your product or your service, and how they felt, and then how they feel afterwards. It's very much built around the human experience of all this. And so, uh, and, and when you build, you intentionally craft these power stories around that humanity, that is where you start to get that very human re- emotion and reaction that storytelling is so known for. Example that I love to tell people about is the moment when I was standing in the middle of my kitchen during lunch and I was holding a bag of bagels in my hand and I was standing there starting to have feelings for a bag of bagels. And I'm sitting there scratching my head, just kind of grinning, saying, this is crazy. Because here's what ha- there, here's what had just happened. As I was opening up the fridge, looking for something to grab to eat over my lunch hour, I grabbed this bag of bagels and I see the logo of this guy with uh, the, 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 this company logo has this guy with long black ponytail and he's holding an electric guitar. And the name of the company is Dave's Killer Bread. I was looking at this bag of bagels and it, I saw that there's a headline on the side, something to the effect of 15 years is a long time to learn your lesson or 15 years is a long time to get it right or something like that. I don't remember the exact wording. But what I do remember is the fact that they put the, a short story printed on the side of this bag of bagels right underneath that headline that told the story of Dave, the guy whose picture was on the logo, who had made some bad choices in his life. He had ended up in prison for 15 years. And when he got out of prison, he was having a hard time getting work. And so his brother, who was running the family-owned bakery, the family business bakery, uh, decided He saw Dave and saw that he was looking to make a change. So he gave him the chance to come back and work at the family bakery. And so Dave came back and he started doing everything in his power to develop a really amazing, delicious bread. And and he did. And he ended up making this bread that started winning awards. They call it Dave's Killer Bread. It was just that good. But not only did they end up creating delicious killer bread, to this day, they make a point of hiring people to work at their bakery who are the best fit for the job regardless of their criminal background. Over a third of their employees have some sort of criminal background. And this is done on purpose because 
they believe that everyone deserves a second chance. So I'm reading this. I'm standing in the middle of the kitchen and I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. I am feeling feelings for a bag of bagels. <laughs> and this is why to this day, when I walk down the aisle at the, at the grocery store and there are 50 kinds of bread on the shelf, which kind of bread am I going to reach for? I am going to reach for Dave's Killer Bread because they believe in second chances, and so do I. Therefore, I buy their bread. That is the power of strategic storytelling connected to your product or service. Here's the idea of real life narrative, the idea of strategic storytelling in the big picture. And I hardly ever hear anyone talking about this. At Story Greenlight, I call it story alignment. And here's how it works. The basic idea is, it's the idea of real world storylines stacking on top of each other and seeing how they do or don't line up. So it starts with the idea of what the definition of a story is. And for a while now, I've been calling this the master story framework, and I'm actually changing that now. I'm calling this the, the definition of what a story is. And it's the idea of a character who wants something, overcomes obstacles to get it, and experiences a transformation as a result. That is what the def, that, that's the story green light version of what a story is, the working definition. When you think about that, you start to realize that we are all living a story ourselves. And so is every other human being on the planet. And anytime we interact with another person, they have other things that they want. They are a character who want things. And there are different kinds of obstacles standing in their way from getting what they want so they can experience the transformation that they're seeking in their life. So in business, say you are a financial advisor. You are the advisor, say you're the advisor and you want to help people and you want to run a healthy business. You also are working with the storyline of your business itself. Is it a healthy, sustainable business? Does it have what it needs to keep doing what it's doing? You have clients. They have their own storylines. They want to know what to do with their money. They want to know that they will keep their money safe. You may also have staff. Uh, so anyone on your team, they have their own things that they want. They probably involves wanting to know that they have a predictable, secure paycheck. And hopefully they also want to help your clients too and that kind of a thing. So within that, We've just, and that's not even all the storylines going on. I mean, you also have vendors, you have uh, referral partners, you might have uh, professional organizations that uh, have control over what you do or do, don't do or what you can or cannot say in public, um, all kinds of stuff. You can see how all these different storylines and these entities, when they start stacking up on each other, they start getting complicated. And it even gets more complicated from there. Say you are a marketing director at a B2B service or, you know, at, at a B2B company. And uh, you, as the marketing director, let's just say one of the things you want to do is prove that you are not an, a randomly interchangeable <laughs> marketing person, you are valuable, you bring value to the company, and uh, you should not get laid off <laughs> if people are considering downsizing, as so many companies are as of this recording. Uh, you, If you have teams underneath you or people that you interact with, because guaranteed you have some version of that, your team wants to know that they're value that they're valuable. Your vendors want to know that you'll keep using them. Your clients probably have lots of different people in their own companies that have all their own desires and obstacles for them to saying yes to your product or your service. And even internally, your C-suite wants to know what the budget that they're giving you is turning into, uh, they want to make sure that it's actually turning into revenue for their company and how much and by when. So you have story after story after story stacked on top of itself. And so you start asking yourself, 
where do they overlap? Where do they not overlap? And how can we pull them back into alignment if they don't overlap in the right way? And that is the process we dig into with our clients when we talk about story alignment, if that's something that we decide is something that we need to go into. And the, the point of all this, all these examples can be affected by strategic storytelling, understanding that story structure and telling stories in intentional, emotionally impactful ways. Now, the idea of how to do that is a whole world unto itself. I mean, for me, it started out Jeff at age four playing piano, playing Old MacDonald Had a Farm. It moved on to me in high school doing video production, doing radio, doing broadcast TV, doing YouTube, doing podcasting, doing writing, doing business coaching and consulting and all that other, th all those other kinds of things. Um, but for now, let's just remember that even though story might feel like something familiar and not all that amazing at times, the principles of strategic storytelling, crafted, intentional, strategic storytelling, that is what brings all these different elements, all these different media, all these applications to life. It elevates them from being normal and boring to being something amazing and impactful. And when they do that, it literally lights up the brains of your audience. Their brains drop chemicals into their bloodstreams. They start paying attention and feeling things and your audience says yes to what you're asking them to do. It's not a fad. It's not a sales or marketing gimmick. Thank God. This is human physiology. And this is something that we experience every day that we're alive. And making it work for you and your business means that we all get to help change happen in the world. There was a wise man who once said that we can get everything that we want if we will just help people get what they want. And there was an even more wise man who said that we are not here to be served, we are here to serve. And uh, if you'd like help putting these ideas into place for you or your business, hit up the link in the show notes or the video description. And until next time, remember that real people trust real people and that human connection is everything.